Hi, I'm Joshua Farnsworth. In this video, I'm going to show you my preferred quick method for making wooden bench dogs. I'll also show you how I bore holes in my workbench tops for bench dogs and also for holdfasts. The last two videos that I published were about choosing a workbench design and also choosing important workbench accessories. If you missed them, uh, you can see below this video for links to those videos. Uh, in the workbench accessories video, I showed a sped up process of how I make bench dogs and also how I bore bench dog holes and hold fast holes in my school's workbenches here. But I've been asked to give some more details on my process, so that's what I'll do in this video. As I mentioned in the previous videos on workbenches, uh, bench dogs allow you to wedge your work piece between the tail vise and the bench dogs that sit in your bench dog holes. This is so you can stabilize the wood for hand planing and for making joinery. I prefer to make my own round wooden bench dogs. Why? Well, first, because wooden bench dogs won't hurt your hand plane iron if you accidentally forget to move the bench dog down below the board surface when you're hand planing. And second, uh, wooden bench dogs are much cheaper to make than buying metal bench dogs. You just need to buy wooden dowels from your hardware store. Third, boring round bench dog holes in your workbench is really much easier and faster than adding square bench dog holes before you glue up your, your uh, workbench top. So let's talk about how I make bench dogs. To make bench dogs, I buy wooden dowels from the hardware store, as I mentioned. And I've used both three quarter inch oak dowels and one inch pop poplar dowels and other things, and both species have worked fine. In fact, you can use any wood that you want really. Just get whatever you can find. First, I cut the dowels to length. I found that I like mine a little longer than the thickness of the workbench. That way it's easy to push the bench dogs up through the dog holes. Uh, so then I use a pencil to lay out the basic shape of the notch that I'll cut out. I come down about an inch or so from the top, uh, but you can make it whatever depth you want. And you can change it later too. I then use a cross-cut back saw to cut across the grain uh, down to my layout lines. A fine-toothed dovetail saw will also work. I next use a wide chisel to cut the face of the notch. I nibble off about half the wood at first uh, with a very light tap of the mallet on the chisel. But just be careful here because too much force will actually split the dowel super easy. Of course, I speak from experience on this, I'll, I'll admit. <laughs> Then I work back carefully to the line that I drew with the chisel. And if your, your grain is straight, it should split pretty nicely. And then I just use a chisel to pare back to the line and uh, I create a flat and smooth surface with it. Of course, there's no reason to spend too much time on this because it's just a bench dog really and it's not a piece of furniture. And I've got a couple of uh, custom bench dog tricks that I've learned from my friend Will Myers when we made the video together on building the Moravian workbench. The first trick is to add a triangular notch on the other end of the bench dog for the times when I have an odd shaped piece of wood that I need to hold down on the workbench. To do this, I do the same thing as above, uh, but then I lay out a triangle on top. Then I use a dovetail saw to cut at an angle along the top lines and the sides of the dowel at the same time. Then I use a small chisel uh, to remove the waste and clean up the dowel. The second trick is to prevent the bench dog from falling through the dog hole. I bore a little hole on the side of the bench dog and I epoxy a small bullet cabinet door catch inside the hole. I couldn't find these brass bullet catches in any of the stores where I live. Um, but I eventually tracked them down online and I've shared a link to them in my workbench guide article. I'll share a link to that below. Now I'll move on to making bench dog holes and hold fast holes. To make a lot of consistently sized bench dog holes, I actually set up a plunge router with an adjustable fence. 
The adjustable fence allows me to add a bench dog hole at perfectly consistent distances from the edge of the workbench. It also uh, stabilizes the plunge router. I plunge as deep as I can with a three quarter inch or a one inch spiral upcut bit. This setup makes it super easy to just move down the bench as I plunge. The only marks I really have to make are the spacing between the bench dogs. Then I finish boring the hole with a spade bit. I prefer to use a powerful corded drill so I don't burn up the motor on my battery powered drill, especially on thicker workbench tops. Also, you can certainly do this with a brace and bit, uh, but just be prepared for it to take a lot longer and maybe have holes that aren't quite as tight due to the movement while you're boring the holes. I watch carefully for the tip of the spade bit or the lead screw in the case of an auger bit to come through the bottom of the workbench. And actually having a friend or a child watch for you is an even better idea. As soon as the tip starts coming through the workbench top, I stop boring the hole immediately. Then after I've gotten all the bench dog holes to this point, I flip the workbench top over and I start boring back through the little hole. This prevents ugly blowout and gives a nice clean bench dog hole. And hold fast holes are made in just about the same way, except I usually use a slightly larger spade bit when coming back through the bottom. For example, 7 8 inch when I'm doing 3 quarter inch holes. And I bore up an inch or two and a larger hole helps Holdfast have more room to wedge itself. Also, a Holdfast hole can go just about anywhere in the workbench top. It doesn't need to be in a consistent row. Also, just as a side note, I don't like to use my Holdfast in the bench dog holes. I found that it tends to stretch the dog holes out over time, so the bench dogs don't fit very well after that. Well, I hope this video has been helpful to you and hope it has, well, can save you some time and money. And as always, if you have any questions, be sure to ask them below in the comments section. And while you're down there, why not give this video a thumbs up? It'll only take you a second or two. And also make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel here because in my next video, I'll actually be talking about the different uh, marking and measuring tools that you'll likely need for traditional woodworking, uh, like tri-squares, marking gauges, dividers, and much more. So thanks for hanging out here in my shop. This is Joshua Farnsworth. If you're interested in woodworking with a mix of hand tools and power tools, visit my website at woodandshop.com where you can find a bunch of free woodworking lessons, workshop tours of amazing woodworkers, and our very popular tool buying guides. You can ask questions and share your projects with thousands of woodworkers on my forum. Enjoy!